but it is an honor to be here with you. I bring you a greeting from all saints, Reformed Presbyterian Church. It is such a joy to stand here now before you and to preach God's word because that is uh, coming from all, all saints and seeing what God is doing here among you. It is absolutely astounding. And our prayers are with you, and uh, we thank the Lord for you, and we thank the Lord for your pastor. Steve has certainly been a wonderful friend and encourager to, to me, and I hope to be an encouragement to him today. In many ways, this, this sermon is for him, and yet it's for all of us, uh, because all of us need to have a word from God from his book that tells us how we are to live and what God will do for us. And so uh, let me read for you, first of all, from the scriptures. Let's look at Psalm 46 for our reading, Psalm 46. Now, I will also tell you, as you're turning to Psalm 46, I encourage you to have an open Bible. I also encourage you to put bookmarks in two other places in your Bible today. One is in 2 Kings, chapter 18, verses 13 through chapter 19, verse 37 because I'll be referring to that section of Scripture, as well as Isaiah 36 and 37. And you'll see the reason for that here in just a moment. But those two passages will amplify the meaning of our text today. And so I'll refer to them from time to time. But for our Scripture reading this morning and the basic text from which I will be preaching, we turn to Psalm 46. This is the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. God utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come. Behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes the war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Thanks be to God for his word. Father, we now bow our heads and our hearts together before you because we now want to ask for your help, for your strength, and that you would be our refuge in our times of trouble. I pray that your word would speak to the hearts of those here in this congregation this morning who are hurting, broken, struggling, because you, we know that your word is a help to us. And so, Lord, help me to be able to faithfully expound your word and be an encouragement to the hearts of your people and a warning to those who may not be your people. So we ask all of this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that you might bless us. Amen. Now let me take you back about 500 years the year is 1527. A decade has passed since Martin Luther had to finally posted his 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg Church. And though he had been a powerful voice for reform, the voice fell suddenly silent while in the middle of a sermon on April 22 of that year. Luther suffered from dizziness and was even fearful for his life. In the following months, he continued to suffer. Other problems were evidence, such as buzzing in his ear, heart problems, intestinal complications. And adding to his fears, he now became discouraged and 
Describing his own inner emotions, Luther would write this, I spent more than a week in death and hell. My entire body was in pain, and I still trembled. His spirit wavered as he questioned, where's God? And he wondered, why isn't he helping me? Have you not felt like that during times of crisis? I felt it many times in my own life. I felt it this past week in several situations. I had a phone call this week in which someone was in deep desperation, crying out for help in their lives. We come to crisis in our lives. Now, for Luther, about the same time, the dreaded Black Plague broke out in Germany and spread to Wittenberg, where he lived. Those dangers were ever-present. Luther and his wife chose, though, to remain in the city and battle the plague, care for the dying. Their home became a hospital. The burden became greater when Luther's one-year-old son, Hans, became desperately Death enshrouded the city and the soul of this man, Luther. He needed a shelter. He needed a refuge. Psalm 46 whispered comfort to his soul. In fact, Psalm 46 was one of his favorite passages of Scripture. There is a, a great song we sing that he penned from this. I read that he said that in those days when Luther was opposed by the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor, and he felt the pressures of his busy, turbulent life almost too great to bear, he would say to his friend Philip Melanchthon, Come, come, let us sing the 46th Psalm and let the devil do his worst. I'm not sure I want the devil to do his worst, okay? But there are times he does, or at least we feel he's doing his worst in our lives, and we need a place to turn. For Luther... Thus armed with the promises of God and the assurance of his presence, this man pressed on. And so I want us to take a look at this passage, this notable psalm today that Luther loved to sing. As you look at it before you there, I hope you noticed as I was reading, the psalm is, is written in a time of great crisis, trouble. And the background of the psalm itself appears to be connected with a situation in the 8th century B.C. during the reign of Hezekiah, king of Judah, who had become a vassal to the king of Assyria. But after Hezekiah balked at the thought of paying more tribute to this pagan king, this great king, Sennacherib, he swiftly responded. Judah was invaded and attacked by this mighty army, the most brutal and powerful force in the world at that time. And more than 40 cities, fortified cities, surrounding Jerusalem were swallowed up by his advancing armies, with Jerusalem next to the menu. Under great pressure, Hezekiah offered Sennacherib any and everything to appease the wrath of that king. You find that in 2 Kings 18.14. We read that Hezekiah gave him, in that same passage, that Hezekiah gave him the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord. Further, in verse 16 of 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts, and he gave it to the king of Assyria. Those were costly acts of desperation on the part of this man. But Sennacherib wasn't satisfied. He demanded more and applied the heat. He sent officers of his court to taunt Hezekiah and God's people questioning their resolves. Listen to this from 2 Kings 18, 19. Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? What are you resting in? What are you trusting in? Verse 20. In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? And listen to the tirade that follows in those verses in 2 Kings 18. It says, Egypt you made an alliance with Egypt. They can't help you. They're nothing but a broken reed. And your God, your own God, he can't help you. Because Hezekiah, your king, has removed all the religious altars except for only one right there in Jerusalem. Surely this has offended your God to remove all those altars. He'll not come to your aid. Well, it shows you how much that I can do. Because Hezekiah was making reforms. He was getting rid of pagan altars all around. 
And of course, God would bless that. But he went on. Your armies, you think you have an army? Your armies can't help you. In fact, I'll make you a wager, he says in 2 Kings 18. I bet that if we gave you 2,000 horses, you can't find 2,000 riders to set up. He said, nothing and no one can help me. You look around at the 40 plus cities that we have taken and their gods that we have taken Nothing's been able to stop us. None of their gods can stop us. And neither will yours. In fact, in fact, verse 25 of 2 Kings 18 says, Your God told us to come here and defeat you. Isaiah 36, verse 12, puts it very simply. The message is, you are doomed. Now, so that group further threatened the people of Jerusalem who were listening on the rooftops there through his ambassadors. He told them not to put their trust in the Lord. The Lord's not going to help you. And don't listen to anything your king Hezekiah has to say. And so Hezekiah retires to his court. And after receiving final word of warning in the form of a letter, Scripture tells us, Hezekiah took that letter from Sennacherib and he read it. This spelled his doom. He read it. And then he spread it before the Lord. God, I don't have an answer for this. God, we are helpless. We're hopeless. We don't know what to do here. In this time of great trouble, Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and he sent word to the prophet Isaiah that he should pray. Isaiah 37, 1 and 2. Judah was facing a clear and present danger. An enemy stood at their gate. Who wouldn't have been terrified? What's at your gate? What enemy are you facing? What crisis is bearing down upon you? Psalm 46 reveals the answer to their fears in ours when we're desperately troubled. This psalm is really about God. It begins with the name of God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. But you find that very name, God, Elohim, used six additional times. You note also, if you look down, verses 4 and 8, the names Most High and the name Yahweh, all capitals, L-O-R-D, is used. Each of those used once. And then the name, the Lord of hosts, that phrase, the Lord of armies, appears twice. Verses 7 and 11 in a refrain that is here. The structure of the psalm before us is easy to spot. At the end of verse 3, we find the word selah. It was a, perhaps a musical notation or a, a time to, to elevate, a, build a crescendo, or even for us to pause for a moment, to take our breath, to consider, to listen to what we have just heard. It shows up again, not only after verse 3, but after verse 7 and verse 11. And in each of these three sections, the character of God is revealed. And there's a strong refrain heard in verses 7 and 11 that will point out a rich truth we're going to explore here at the end of the message. This psalm sounds forth then a message of encouragement, but also one of warning to those who read it. So let's hang our thoughts today on three truths that I hope will encourage your hearts. I know God's word will be that to you. First, he tells us here in the first section, 1 through 3, God is our help in calamity. God is our help in calamity. Psalm begins with a bold confession and affirmation about God. Look at it in verse 1 now. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Three words, refuge, strength, help paint mental pictures for us. First, refuge. When we're forced to ask, who can I trust? Back over in 2 Kings chapter 18, if you read through that passage, you'll find at least seven times, I believe six times, that the word trust is used. Who are you trusting? Where are you going to trust? Where are you going to turn? The Hebrew word refuge, in fact, is closely associated with the idea of trust because the verbal form 
I take refuge, is a, a verb that can be translated, I trust in God. But listen to what the psalmist has written earlier, or, or a little bit later. In Psalm 61, 1 to 3. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer from, from the end of the earth. When I call upon you when my heart is faint. I'm, I'm at the end. My heart is wavering. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Or in the very next psalm, Psalm 62, verses 7 and 8. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Can you hear the heart cry? It's going through something deep. God is a refuge. But God also is our strength when we're tempted to ask, how will we ever bear up under this? How will we ever find our answers? How will we survive? Well, God is your strength. He gives you strength through the crisis. Psalm 28, 7 says this, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. And I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. Especially mark this down, Psalm 59. Listen to what it says here. It's 59 verses 16 and 17. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. Now listen to this. He gives God a name that you don't see elsewhere. Oh, my strength. Oh, my strength. I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. So be affirmed. God is our refuge. God is also our strength. We not only hide in him, but we come to him for everything that we need to bear up under the burdens. But he says also that God is our help. When we're pressed to ask, where will we find aid? In fact, look at this phrase in verse 1. God is a very present help. Interesting expression. And we might think, okay, a very present help. Okay, he's, he's right there. Yes, that's true. But literally, the Hebrew here is a help ready or present or enough exceedingly. That is, God is all sufficient. He is not a God who is simply going around helping people. He's not just a good person. No, he is their help. Completely, period. Everything that we need, everything that we must have, that is God to us. And the psalmist has come to that point. Who can I trust? How can I find strength? Where can I find aid? These are the questions that are echoing in the heart of my Hezekiah often in our own. And we sense why he makes that statement when we notice the last word of that verse 1, trouble. That word describes someone who's in a, in a tight spot, someone who's in a jam. But it can also refer to inner turmoil that seemingly cannot be overcome, just like that call I had this week. There was someone crying out, not because of an external problem, though there was a problem. It was something inside they were dealing with, struggling with. Psalm 25, 17 says this, using this very same word in the Hebrew. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. You know, if you've got an enlarged heart, that could be a problem, right? But when the troubles of your heart are enlarged, that's real problems. And how bad is it? Look at verses 2 and 3. Four times we read the word though. Mark those in your Bible. If you mark your Bible, it indicates an ever-intensifying trouble that he is facing here in catastrophic proportions. Though the earth gives way. It's like you're standing there and all of a sudden, earth begins to depart. Though the mountains be moved to the heart of the sea, they start crumbling and falling into the sea. Though its waters roar with foam, 
we could hardly stand it. Though the mountains tremble at its swelling. You ever been in an earthquake? Never been in a tornado or nearby. How everything just shakes. This is what the world was like. His world was shaken. His foundations were breaking up. It's terrifying to the people who are going through this experience. The world was crumbling around them. I, I, you might even sense that today, not from a natural disaster, but from a political disaster, because that's what's happening here. They're being invaded. I don't know what all your thoughts is about this beloved country that we have, but do you ever feel like things are crumbling? You ever think, feel like things are shaken? His world was shaken. His foundation's breaking up. These are violent images, oh, fitting of a disaster movie. But here, the earth and the mountains, the reason why he uses these is they're symbols of everything that's invincible and stable. You go up into the, the Smoky Mountains and the Blue Ridge Parkway and you drive along there and you see all these majestic mountains and you think, wow, aren't they strong and mighty? But just think if all of a sudden they were leveled and everything around you is crumbling. And all these things, and note the verbs here, give way, be moved, tremble because of a menacing threat. And the picture here is a restless sea in verse 2. There is a place of refuge and strength and help. Wire himself even though everything else is shaken, he says, verse 2, we will not fear. Where comes this renewed confidence when a great king like Sennacherib is at your gates and he's ready to take you and kill you? Alan Ross in his commentary on the psalm says this, that we will not fear is the proper conclusion to the theology of the first verse. If God is your refuge, if God is your strength, if you know he is a very present help, all sufficient help in the time of trouble, therefore, we don't need to fear. And he says here, we will not fear. Why is that there is another king who has something to say? Isaiah the prophet writes this in Isaiah 37, 6. Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard. The nations rage and rant. Don't let that shake you up. There's a greater king yet to speak. Because God will be their help. There's no need to fear. Now, this takes us to our next section. Verses 4 to 7. Where God is our joy in adversity. That, that sounds so extremely opposite, doesn't it? When I'm in adversity, I struggle with joy. I struggle with some kind of happiness. But let's see what the psalmist says. In contrast to all that roaring and foaming of the restless seed and the sea and the, a swelling tide of danger around him, mentioned in two and three. The psalmist now transports us to another place. It's almost like paradise. He says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. You see, the river is making glad. It's providing a reason for rejoicing, making glad the people of God. Now, we live in Richmond. Richmonders love to go down to the river. Let's go down to the river. I enjoy going down to the river. I enjoy going to the water. I'm a person that likes all of that. In fact, one of my favorite memories came just a few years ago. And Kathy and I and some family members who were here went down tubing on the James with professional outfitters on the day of the full eclipse. Do you remember the full eclipse when that happened? Everybody's getting their glasses and everything so they can see it. That was amazing to see that happen. I'm waiting for the eclipse where the sun comes between the earth and the moon. Now that's going to be spectacular. Never mind. <laughs> I just want to see if you're listening. Well, going down the James and those rafts, it was such fun. Except for the moment when we hit one of the boulders and my wife Kathy went airborne. 
a little bit of a crisis there in the moment. And somehow I'm sitting off and I just reach up and grab her. And somehow she stayed in the tube. I am so glad for that. And she is too, quite frankly. <laughs> but, but Jerusalem, now think about this. He says there is a river. But when you look at Jerusalem, it's one of the few great cities on earth that has no river running through it. So what does he say? There is a river. Some argue that this might be a reference to Guyon Spring, the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. Certainly the spring did provide water, a water supply. If they were besieged, they did have water. And there was encouragement in that. In fact, Hezekiah had built an aqueduct down from that spring up into the inner city. It would help them. But the stream or currents of water in Psalm 46 was symbolic of something far greater. We're thinking too small here about just Gihon Spring bringing them pleasure when Sennacherib is at their door. No, this, this symbolizes the very presence of God among them. Earlier in the Psalms, this is what we read. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is a fountain of life. Psalm 26, verses 7 and 9. Or listen to Psalm 65, verse 9. You visit the earth with water and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. When you think about it, the Bible begins with God creating a river in the Garden of Eden. It then flows outward with blessing. The Bible ends with a river. Revelation 22, 1 and 2, the angel of the Lord showed me the river of the water of life, the brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, that is Jesus Christ, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding a fruit each month. Ezekiel 47 and Zechariah 14 speak of this river that will spring forth. It's a picture of God and the presence of God. Or in John chapter 4, we read that Jesus offered a woman by a well living water. And he said, if you knew the gift of God that was who was asking you, you give me a drink, you would have asked of him. He would have given you living water. And she wanted to know where he would get this water. Was he greater than their father Jacob? And he answered, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus further followed that up in chapter 7 of John's Gospel, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he said this about the Spirit, who those who believed in him were to receive. So the river... Here is a picture of God being with us, Father, Son, and Spirit. And this is confirmed in verse 5 when it says, God is in the midst of her. There's a river. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. In this time of fear and uncertainty, the writer has found high ground, holy ground as he senses the presence of God with him. And this God is a very present help, notice again, when morning dawns. Now in scripture, the dawn often represented a day of deliverance. Israel was delivered from the Egyptians and the Red Sea at dawn, Exodus 14, 27. Psalm 17, 15 speaks of awaking to find that God has brought help that next morning. As we saw in Psalm 59 or 16 earlier, the writer said, I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for you have been to me a refuge in the day of my distress. Now think about this. What Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem were worried about, what they were about to lose sleep about, because on this night, as he had this letter, he knew the very next morning Sennacherib was going to strike. In fact, here's the words of Hezekiah that is preserved for us in Isaiah 37, 3. 
this day is a day of distress, of rebuke, of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. God, we're exhausted. There, there's, there's no more ability to push. What are we going to do, God? And so they go to bed that night, if they can sleep, waiting for tomorrow, a day of reckoning. Tomorrow. How many of you have laid your head on the pillow at night and said, oh, I don't want to face tomorrow. I don't want to face the problem again. I don't want to face the crisis, the turmoil. I don't think I can stand it. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Sometimes we hope it never comes. God, just take us on. But check out what God does. Here's the rest of the story. For some of you who are as old as I am, you remember Paul, Paul Harvey had the rest of the story. You know, here's the rest of the story. 2 Kings 19.35 And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. Listen. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. You go to bed at night thinking tomorrow's the end. You wake up the next morning and you look out and these movers and shakers from Assyria didn't move. Though the mountains may be moved when troubles march into our lives and our hearts, as in verse 2, the city of God's dwelling, the people of God will not be moved, verse 5. Verse 2, verse 5, same word about moving. No, you're not going to be moved because God is with them. God is for them. So who can be against them? That's why we read Romans chapter 8. That's God's word of encouragement to us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Look at verse 6. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. Oh, they come marching out. They come marching out in force. 185,000 troops against Jerusalem. But God will speak. One word. And the earth will melt before him. The same voice that brought all things into existence will speak again to dismantle all their rage against God and his people. And a so-called great king, Sennacherib, has spoken. But there is a greater king who will always have the last word. In whatever trouble you are facing, God will have the last word. God will dispel the enemy. And God's people will be glad to rejoice in their true king and sing his praise. So God is our joy in every adversity because he is with us. He will deliver us. After all, he is the God of Jacob. Do you see? That's part of the refrain here twice. He's the God of Jacob. Why? I mean, I always thought he's the God of Abraham or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why are you just the God of Jacob? One commentator says the reference to Jacob speaks not only of God's covenant with the patriarch, but God's power and grace in dealing with the needy Jacob and his descendants. Jacob had more issues. I'll just put it that way. Be kind. Jacob had more issues than maybe anybody else in Scripture. He was called Jacob, a usurper. But God was always there because God is faithful. In fact, even when we are faithless, God is faithful. If God helped Jacob, and he did, then our God will help us. That's the whole point. Now, let me make one final observation here. And it's not 12 o'clock yet. If God helped Jacob here, and now we see something is going to happen, and that is, verses 8 through 11, God is our peace in uncertainty. God is our peace. He's our help. Is our joy, is our peace, and uncertainty. So as the sun breaks upon the horizon on that fateful day of 701 B.C., all that the king and all the people of God feared has vanished or been vanquished. 
Sennacherib, the troubled maker, finds himself in trouble because Sennacherib departs, returns home to Nineveh, hearing rumors that his kingdom is being attacked. This is in 2 Kings 19, verses 36 and 37. And so while he then returns home, he goes to the altar of his idol, this rock, and two of his own sons strike him down with the sword there, killing Sennacherib. Oh, how the high and mighty are fallen, and all who are will. And that's what we're looking at here in this final section. This point, two commands are now pressed upon the reader in Psalm 46. First, we see in verse 8, look at what God did. He says, come, behold, open your eyes, see the works of the Lord. See what I can do on your behalf to deliver you in the most impossible situation that you can imagine. We view the carnage left behind after the angel of the Lord struck down the Assyrians. The day before had been a day of panic, but on this day the hearts of God's people have found peace as God was faithful to deliver them from their enemies. Just look! God has been truly a present help. In the very moment that they needed help, God was there. And his people are called to raise their eyes then to another horizon, a distant horizon, to see the promise of God and our future hope of deliverance. Verse 9, he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. We see what God will one day do over all the earth when final judgment comes, when every kingdom and person who rage against God will be put in their place. He will bring an end of all troubles. He will break and shatter all that fight against his will, and every enemy will be destroyed, including death itself, the final enemy. He follows the second command as we pause to survey the field of battle. Here's what you should do. We see what God has done. Here's, he says, what you should do. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. It might come as a surprise to you to learn that those words, be still and know, were not spoken to quiet our hearts. They were to quiet the enemy. Be still and know. We, you, you, if you Google be still and know. You find all kinds of books of sweet, tender, kind devotionals. Devotional thoughts to comfort you and bring you cheer. No, these words were actually spoken to the nations who had been raging. Quiet! Shut up! Enough! Be still! Stop the raging and the roaring. You're boasting in your defiance against God. These words in Psalm 46 are rebuked to a restless world that often rages like an angry sea. This God says, quiet. It reminds me of how Jesus spoke the words to a raging sea, be still, peace, be still, Mark 4, 39. But God laughs. God laughs at those who taunt him. He will speak in his wrath to quiet him. God has something else to say to those who need to hear in verse 10. Be still and know. What does he want them to recognize? A plain fact. The truth is God is God. Be still and know that I am God. You are not. He is sovereign over all things. But they thought they were sovereign over all things. You see, God has set his king in Zion his holy hill, who will reign forever. And so we're to be wise, to be warned. God will prevail. This psalm, therefore, kind of works right alongside Psalm 2. And where it says, kiss the son, lest he be angry. You make your peace with God. Be still. Make your peace with God. But notice now in verse 10, it ends on this note. God is God. He says, I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And this deliverance will become 
a reality over all the earth. You know, all the earth is mentioned three times here in the passage, verse 8, 9, and 10. And therefore, we need not fear if God will overcome all things. Jesus said this in John 16, in the world, you will have tribulation. Now, there's going to be troubles. Just because I preach the psalm doesn't mean you're not going to have a struggle today or this coming week. What it means is you have a refuge. You have someone who will give you strength. You have someone who will be ever present to help you. So let me boil this down to a simple statement. God will triumph. God will triumph. We must trust. Are we trusting God when things get difficult? God is not only our present help, He is our future hope. Now, let me summarize. And in this psalm, writer has asked us to reflect once again Zebra, on what he has said and consider the truth that he's that we can find in these lines. When the enemy seems to have the upper hand and we're tempted to think that things are falling apart, and when the world has been turned upside down, and when panic sets in for all of us, here's God's promise and provision. He is our refuge and strength, a very present help. And that reminds me of one final theme I promised earlier I would talk about. It's repeated in the psalm, so we dare not miss it. Trace this thread with me. Look down at Psalm 46. Look at verse 1. God is a very present help. Verse 5, he is in the midst of her. Verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. Then verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. People of God, people of God, listen. God is with you. God is for you. God is among you. He is your help, your strength, your refuge. But you say, now wait a minute. That was written some, what, 2,700 years ago? What confidence can I have that these words are true, that God is a help, that God is with us? And I'm glad you asked that. The answer is, God promised a Redeemer, a Helper, someone to be with us. Isaiah wrote of that person, and he said his name would be Emmanuel which means God with us. And the opening gospel of the New Testament, Matthew, declares that God was true to his word, and he is true to his word. A virgin named Mary gave birth to a son who had bared the name Jesus, but he would save his people from their worst enemy, themselves and their sin. But Jesus would also have another name, as Matthew tells us, fulfilling the promise spoken by Isaiah, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And John's gospel again tells us, and I know you've been preaching through John's gospel, that this word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14. He tabernacled among us. Do you know that's the same word that's used here when it says there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation? Habitation there is tabernacle. It's all right there. He tabernacled among us. We are his holy habitation. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells within. He is with you. We have seen here in the psalm our God is all powerful, He is ever present with His people, which is just what Jesus Himself told us in some of His final words. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, this is our strong comfort as God's people. This is our sure hope in a broken world and with our broken lives that God is with us. Have you made God your refuge? Have you made Jesus Christ your hope, your help, your strength, your redeemer? Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful song. Thank you for the truths that we have seen here. And now, arm your people with this truth, with this encouragement, by your spirit. Help each of us to see that God is for us. 
that God is with us, that God is among us. We're your people, the sheep of your pasture. So help us in our troubles. Help us in our crises. Help us in our nation. Lord, may we turn back to you. May we be still and know that you are God. And so we rest in you. When you're our refuge, our weakness is replaced by your strength. Our fear is replaced by your joy. Our trouble is replaced with your peace. And so bless us together. And we praise your glorious name. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, 